Thank you, Ray. Uh, it's great to be back in Geelong. I've uh, spent a many uh, an Australia Day weekend down here at the Festival of Sales, so it's a great place. Uh, great to be here. Never been here and been so cold, though. Never been here in winter. Um, but so thanks for everyone coming along. Um, as a society, we have a great fascination with stars, regardless of their ability. With buildings, it's quite similar. However, we do focus on the, abil uh, the ability of the building to deliver performance. But we've, with buildings, we have star ratings across Natters, Neighbours and Green Star, whether it be residential buildings or commercial buildings. So we have quite a, a wide range of different stars that we're looking at with buildings. And it's potentially easy to be become confused with uh, what's going on there. Likewise for consumers, when you look at appliances, there's more star ratings and it's more confusion being brought into the play. So for an appliance, for example, you've got the fridge on the left, 510 kilowatt hours a year. It achieves a three star rating. The TV, 872 kilowatt hours a year. Higher number, but it gets a higher star rating. So there's no consistency in these star ratings and it's very hard for consumers then to understand where the consistency is or where the deliverables are for a star rating for a building. So they can walk into a, um, a Harvey Norman or a um, Good Guys and look at the star rating on an appliance. And then they say, oh, the builder's building me a six star house. It must be market leading. Well, it's not necessarily market leading. It's the building code compliance solution. There are alternatives and there are options uh, to go beyond the building code, which is why we're here today as well. Um, adding to that confusion is that there's no real clear indication as to whether we're actually delivering upon the star ratings. So the star ratings, uh, especially in the household energy rating uh, scheme, uh, is a theoretical um, calculation. It's a prediction of what the house should be capable of uh, delivering. So the CSIRO and Swind Swinburne University have conducted a couple of different studies over the last few years. And the CSIRO study found that approximately half of all homes delivered under this study, and they were all less than five years old, uh, were overrated at the design stage. So what this meant was that the houses that were being delivered weren't achieving their design star rating. And this was achieving by more than, le uh, by more than half a star less than the design rating. What they also found, both studies found, was that over half of all insulation installation practices were considered average or poor. So even though the insulation installers may come in and do the right job, someone else and subsequent trade through the construction process could be undoing that good work of the insulation installers. So we, we discovered, and the industry has discovered, there's a clear gap between the theory and the reality, that we're not delivering the, uh, the designed intent for the buildings um, when they get completed and handed over to consumers. We also conducted a, a little bit of a reality test on our own and as Ray mentioned we did we conducted a co-heating test on the CSR house. Now what this meant was is that you can see there's silver foil on the uh, windows so we've turned the house into a meth lab. We've basically covered it up so you can't get any daylight into there. Um, but there's a reason for that. We don't want solar heat going into the building. We heat the house up using heaters in, internally to, to 25 degrees. We hold the house at 25 degrees for over 10 days. And then we turn the heaters off and we measure the rate of decline of the, uh, the temperature in the house as well. But what it, by measuring the, the energy input into the heating equipment, that gives us an indication of exactly what energy loss is being uh, lost through the building envelope. Through back calculations, we can then calculate the total system R value of the entire house and the actual R value that's being achieved by the entire uh, building envelope. We've also conducted a wide range of other uh, research and measurements on the house. We've conducted acoustic tests. We've conducted some uh, air tightness testing using blower door uh, equipment. Uh, and we've even, um, as Ray said, we've filled the house with smoke and measured the ventilation rates as well. So we've done, we've, we use the house as a great um, guinea pig uh, and we've teamed up with the University of New South Wales and CSIRO. Uh, we've got a PhD student with the University of New South Wales working with us to analyse the data. So it's a, it's a great uh, living laboratory effectively to, uh, to help us um, conduct our research. So as Ray suggested, the, the house when we finished it had a great feel. 
Uh, so we started to do some analysis and we wanted to understand exactly how we achieved that feel. Uh, so we sat down and, it- and itemised a bunch of the performance criteria within the house and we identified the 11 items that um, you saw in Ray's slides a few minutes ago. Uh, now these 11 items we've wor- we discovered have to work together. There's trade-offs between each item. There's trade-offs between a number of these items. And you have to balance a lot of these, um, the performance criteria for each of these items to get holistic, great building performance. And the principle works as well, just as well for commercial buildings as well as, well as uh, residential buildings. Uh, an example of this is that we've seen around the country reports in the, in the trade media of eight and nine star buildings being delivered for six star prices. Well, that's great. That's fantastic. But it's a, it's a little bit uh, misleading in terms of just that. If you just look at those attributes, then that's fantastic. However, you've got to look at the livability of these buildings. And what the builders have discovered is that, uh, that you can optimise this, but without focus on the rest of these items, you're going to compromise on some of those livability aspects and some of the comfort attributes, such as daylight or even moisture management or ventilation control as well which I'll cover off a lot of that uh, as I go, go through my presentation. Uh, we could spend hours and hours and hours discussing all of these 11 items. Today we're discussing the, the key uh, items that are, um, are delivering the most bang for our buck. So firstly I'll, I'll talk about, because I'm doing the heat part of the ham equation, I'm talking about thermal comfort. So. We conducted over two million combinations and calculations to work out the cost optimal solutions for the construction options in the CSO house. Uh, and here you've got the cost up the uh, left hand side of the scale. And, yep. and then running across the base of the scale, you've got the star rating. So you can see as we move to the right, the star rating increases. And yes, the cost increases. So we've, we've modelled here, we've modelled a, a range of different uh, glazing ratios. The blue is a 28% glazing ratio, which is the window area to the floor area, and that's the as-built glazing ratio of the house. The purple is a 25% glazing ratio, and the green is a 20% glazing ratio. The red diamonds represent the most cost-optimal solutions to achieve eight-star, and that's, that's the delivered house in, in uh, Sydney's west. Um, and you can see there, as we go down the scale with the glazing ratios, it does get cheap, uh, more, more cost effective to uh, deliver these, this performance. Uh, and we've, we've modelled a wide range of different insulation levels, we've modelled d- different orientations and different climate zones as well. So a lot of this, this data is relevant for the whole country and different uh, climatic uh, conditions, but also different um, insulation levels and different um, orientations. So it's not just on a perfect orientation as well. What this led us to was to start looking at firstly insulation. And this is basically a representation of the most cost optimal insulation levels that we've found to improve on the bare minimum building code compliance. So you're not every house is going to achieve eight star, but this is to, to achieve better than six star performance in most states in Australia. So in a cooler climate, you're looking at a minimum of R5 in the ceiling and a minimum of R2.5 in the walls. In the mixed climates, in the warmer climate zones, that could be brought back a little bit. Uh, and then in warmer or trapi- tropical climates, it's more about shading and, uh, and airflow and, um, and, bre- and cross ventilation. But insulation specifications are only take you one, uh, one step. As I suggested earlier, the insulation installation is critical to uh, performance of the building as well. The building code uh, pays reference to this. It mentions that when requ- where required, bulk insulation must be installed that it maintains its position and thickness. So in summary, the R value of bulk insulation will be reduced if it is compressed or if its thickness is less than the specified thickness that it's um, delivered in. The R value of, ca- of insulation is calculated and the R value is the thermal resistance, so the resistance to heat flow. It's calculated by calculating by dividing the thickness of the insulation by the conductivity of or the K value of that particular insulation. And you can see using uh, these thermal images here, where it's hot on the outside of the wall, where the insulation is compressed at the top of the wall, there's more heat flow coming into the building. 
at the base of the wall where there's less compression and the insulation is almost at its full, full thickness, there's less heat flow coming into the building. So you can see there that basically this, this photo, this thermal image shows you exactly that equation in uh, working in principle. Trades, as I said, trades impact on the insulation. So the subsequent trades that come through after when, you, um, when you're doing, um, after you've got your ceiling linings in and, um, and you're doing final fit, uh, could be air conditioning installers trampling on, squashing the insulation, electricians lifting up the insulation to run cables. Uh, and basically, you can see here, uh, this thermal image in the centre is an indication of what's happening during winter, where it's warm inside the building and it's cool outside. So all the darker, the purple, the blue and the red items are cool spots in the, uh, in the, in the lining in the building. And that represents heat loss. So the heat's actually transferring out of the building. Where it's yellow is a good coverage of insulation. Here the uh, air conditioning installers have ripped up the insulation to install the duct and the ceiling register. And you can see here the impact of that, where the heat flow is just um, screaming. The heat, the heat is just flowing straight out through the ceiling and the cornices uh, in, the, uh, in the, that room there. We did a little bit of a test. We, uh, because it is a, a research facility, we decided to rip up some insulation and replace it with thinner levels of insulation. And you can see here where there's no insulation, the heat flow just, uh, just streams straight out of the building and where we've got a perimeter bat or a, a thinner piece of insulation near the edge of the wall, uh, the heat flow is uh, are dramatically reduced. Why is this important? Well, we've got a lot thicker insulation being installed in buildings these days, especially in roof spaces. So with the thicker R, or the higher R values, the thickness is increasing. We're seeing some insulation bats up to 290 mil thickness. Uh, most are around the 240, 250 mil thickness. Uh, but what that represents is an issue with contact of, of the insulation with the roofing materials. So where we've got sarking in this case, or even if the roofing um, was unsarked, you'd still have a potential issue if that, the insulation was installed all the way out to, to the uh, top plate of the wall, of the external wall. The alternate here is that you install the insulation out there and it's, it's squashed against the roofing material. This represents an issue with potential for condensation dripping and moisture damage to the uh, ceiling linings or the cornices and to your top plate of your wall frames. Uh, so it's a non-compliant install according to the building code. So both options are non-compliant. So at the CSR house we had the luxury of extending the roof a little bit higher and playing around with the trusses. Um, so we basically managed to install the insulation all the way out. We fully covered the top plate. The building code requires you to uh, cover 50 mil of the top plate. Uh, but maintaining this gap so that we, we did, weren't squashing the insulation or, um, or um, introducing a, um, a, a, a heat leak or a condensation risk into the building. Not every building can be designed like this and not every um, uh, roof truss can be extended in height. So the insulation industry has been working over the last few years to develop the concept of a perimeter bat, as you saw with our photo a few slides ago, uh, where you introduce a lower profile piece of insulation around the perimeter of the, of the building. This then maintains the gap of the insulation to the roofing materials, and you're allowed, and you're still able to install the thicker bats to the outside, uh, as far as you can to maintain that gap. This has just been incorporated into the latest uh, Australian Standard 3999 for the installation of bulk insulation, which was released only three weeks ago. So it's now a, uh, a, an alternate solution and it um, will uh, ensure a suitable coverage of insulation in your ceiling spaces. Likewise with windows, we've conducted a fair amount of research and, and analysis into working out what the cost optimal solutions are for window performance. And with windows, it's not just about the glazing, it's about the whole window performance. So the U value is the inverse of the R value. So the U value is effectively um, showing us what, so with the U value, the lower the better. Um, so here we've given some examples. A good or a U value of roughly 4.8 would be an aluminium frame with uh, low E glass or smart glass. A better solution would be an aluminium frame with, um, with double glazing and the best solution that is pretty much available on the market would be a thermally broken or timber or UPVC uh, frame. 
with a low E double glazed unit. Um, the solar heat gain is uh, very much needs to be tuned to the climate. With the CSR house, we did an analysis around the country, as I said, and we've achieved uh, a star rating in all major climate zones of the NATHER scheme. And in the colder climates, uh, the, in Sydney, sorry, uh, the, star, the house achieved an 8.1 star rating. In uh, the cooler climates down around Melbourne and Geelong, uh, it was achieving at about a 7.4 to 7.5 star rating. We looked at that a little bit, uh, and then we looked at the colour of the glass. And we had a neutral toned or a light grey glass specified in that, uh, in that specification. We swapped that out for a clear glass, which bumped up the solar heat gain coefficient, and the whole star rating of the house jumped by about half a star. So we're back up to pretty much close to the uh, eight star rating um, in the cooler climates. So that's where you need to tune those solar heat gains or shading coefficients to um, match the local climate. But with windows, as I said, the whole window U-value is important and the whole window performance, so the window suite is performance. So here you can see with this window, we've got a double glazed low E uh, glazing unit installed in a thermal, thermally leaking window frame. So this is an aluminium window frame, and you can see here the cold spots. There's a, a cold spot in the spacer within the uh, double glazed unit, and there's a cold spot around the perimeter of the window frame. So this is effectively the equivalent of putting a V8 engine in a Datsun 120Y. It's just, it's mindless, mind-numbingly silly. Uh, why, we per, why we persist with these sort of, this sort of technology in Australia when we've proven overseas in Europe and North America that UPVC uh, window frames can be cost effective. You just get enough volume through the factory and they'll be cost, as cost effective as, as uh, straight aluminium frames. They'll probably be more cost effective than uh, thermally broken aluminium frames as well. So, and then otherwise you go to a timber frame, uh, which can look fantastic, just has a little bit of a maintenance issue. But you can see here that it's just, you're, you're fighting against a thermal wound here uh, by specifying good glass but not putting it in the right chassis. If you get good glazing and if you get good insulation levels, then your strategic placement and, uh, of your thermal mass is important. Now, thermal mass can come in the form of your concrete slab on ground, uh, which in this case we've tiled on top of the concrete. But it can also come in the form of reverse brick veneer or um, double brick cavi um, cavity brick construction with a high level of insulation in the cavity. This, um, when you get good placement of thermal mass, it can act as, as a great heat sink or a heat regulator within the building. However, as this video shows, when you put a rug or you lay carpet over the thermal mass, you're effectively insulating that thermal mass. You're negating the effects of the thermal mass uh, that it has in delivering thermal stability to the building. So you're not allowing the thermal mass to absorb that uh, solar heat in, during the cooler months. And you're not allowing really the, the, solar, the thermal mass to absorb excess heat during the uh, hot summer months either. So the, the laying carpet or putting a rug over a thermal mass can be counterproductive. But when you get it all right, when you do a good job, the results can be um, quite astounding. So this is CSR House in the living room on the hottest day on record in Sydney. Uh, January 18, 19, uh, 19, January 18, 2013. The temperature at uh, Schofields in Sydney West hit 45.7 degrees. The green line is the internal air temperature of the living room. The peak temperature there is 31 degrees. We deliberately left the air conditioning system off over that entire summer just to see how the house would perform. And when we turn the ceiling fans on, however, the feels like temperature dropped to about 26 to 27 degrees. So if it's 45 degrees outside and it's 27 degrees inside, I know where I'd, I'd like to be. And this isn't just a summer thing. Likewise, with winter, the thermal stability of, of the CSR house is quite impressive as well. So out at the location where it's built, we regularly get uh, um, below two degrees throughout winter. There'll be at least 10 to 12 days through winter where it's below two degrees in the morning. And the thermal stability of the, uh, of the, of the living room is quite astounding. It never gets below 16 degrees, where it's, where it's regularly below two degrees. Uh, and that's a combination of that insulation, glazing, thermal mass, and as we'll discuss a little bit later, the air tightness of the building and the shading as well. 
So as I, as I alluded to, there is a bit of an air tightness story. Angus is going to cover off most of the air tightness. However, what we discovered during the coheating test was that air leakage had a direct correlation with the R value of the house, so that total system R value of the house. So we can see here where the cool air is leaking into the house during a blower door test. Uh, well, what we did was, during the coheating test, we measured the R value, but we also, because we've got a weather station on the roof, we were able to measure the wind, the wind speed. So across the base of this, this uh, chart, we've got the wind speed increasing to the right. And the total R value of the house is measured on the left on the vertical axis. The blue dots are the actual measurements conducted. And the blue line is a trend line for those measurements. You can see as the wind speed increases, the R value of the house actually decreases because you're getting a bit of air leakage. So in a mildly leaky or a very leaky building, you're going to have a lot more heat loss or heat gain, whether it's hot or cold outside. So you can see here, the orange and the green lines are predictions of where and calculations of where the uh, total R value of the house would be if the house was more leaky. So you can see a great degradation in the total R value, which means a great level of heat loss or heat gain in summer. So a lot of these uh, things are quite easy to, um, to check and quite easy to monitor. Uh, thermal imaging cameras used to be very expensive. Uh, they're now more affordable than ever. Both of these options are less than $1,000. The option on the left is a, um, an add-on device, a clip-on device to a smart camera, a smartphone, and the item on the right is a, uh, it's a standalone thermal imaging camera. Uh, the one on the right is around about $900. The one on the left is about $600. So they're quite affordable now. You can use them to check the work of the contractors that are going on onto buildings. You can see uh, whether anyone's disturbing the insulation. You can see the performance of the building. You can even spot for gaps or small, small holes in the insulation. Uh, you can also use it to show your clients. You can prove to your clients that you're doing a great job if you've got a great level of uh, co coverage of your insulation. So that's a little bit about the thermal comfort element. But as I suggested, the, the eight and nine star houses that have been built for the same price as a six star house, there's a little bit of a, um, a bit of an issue there because what we found was that uh, the windows were being reduced. So there was less ventilation and less daylight coming into these homes. So they were, they were achieving a great star rating, but were they comfortable? Were, did they deliver a, a whole level of comfort to the, to the occupants? So we did some analysis on the CSR house again. We did some uh, theoretical modelling where we looked at the penetration of light uh, through the windows to see the, the spread of light through the, uh, through the building. We then also did some uh, analysis after the coheating test when we were peeling off those foil coverings off the windows. And this is what the building code allows us to get away with. That's a 10% glazing ratio. So 10% of the floor area is given up as windows in the walls. And that's the level of light, daylight coming into that room. And the light sensor is sitting on the kitchen vents and you can see the level of light there. If we increase that to 15% of glazing ratio, and most project builders and most volume uh, builders are between 15 and 18%, you can see there's a greater level of light coming into the room. It's still got a few dark corners, but it's, it's looking a little bit better. At a 20% glazing ratio, the light meter is now reading over 200 lux. Now this is important because this is generally where most medical professionals or most um, optical professionals suggest that the minimum light level should be to do a, conduct a task. So task lighting should be at least 200 lux. So here we've now achieved that. So you don't actually have to do anything in the kitchen without turning the lights on in the middle of the day. If we increase it to 25%, you can see there's more light filled and we're getting a, a great level of um, a even spread of light coming through the, through the room. At the um, maximum glazing ratio and across the whole house is 28%, uh, you can see there's an abundant level of light and we're getting a great level of spread of light and we're getting a great connection as well to the outside. So um, daylight is important, but also connectivity to the outside world is important. Through our um, research, we wanted to do the cost modelling and we did some more cost modelling to see uh, where the, where the um, cost optimal solutions were again. So we 
uh, set the glass at standard clear glass through these windows and we, we played around with the glazing ratios. And you can see at the 28% maximum glaze, glazing ratio, as we reduced the glazing ratio, the star rating was increasing, but the cost to achieve it was decreasing. So here we have a 10% glazing ratio where the rooms are quite dark, the most cost optimal solution would be achieved. However, who, who wants to live in a, in a building that's that dark? So we found that 20% was about the sweet spot and we found a, a great level of daylight so it was achieved at 20% glazing ratio. So we took that for our next level of analysis and, and basically the 20% glazing ratio using clear glass, we then introduced low E glazing. So you can see we've achieved almost a full star rating increase with a minimal or nominal cost increase. We then introduced double glazing, and that's clear, clear double glazing. So a little bit more of a cost increase, but we've increased the star rating, the peak star rating, by about 0.75 stars. When we introduce low E double glazing, we're almost hitting that eight star, and with a little bit of fine tuning with the design, we, we achieve the eight star. But with a, and, and it's an only a nominal cost increase to go from the double glaze unit to the low E double glaze unit. So you can see here, it does cost more to actually achieve uh, high performance, but you're getting a, whole, a holistic performance to the building, you're getting a more livable space within the building, and you're getting a better outcome for the, uh, for the occupants of the building. We also conducted some consumer research, and the question we asked the consumers was, rate the qualities of a home, or what would you attribute to contributing to comfort within your home? And surprising to us, natural light came out as number two. We thought it would have been a little bit lower, but it came out as a close-ranked second of importance for consumers. So it, it reconfirmed that we're on the right track with this natural light and glazing ratio story. So if you look at glazing, so a comparison of three different types of glass. So the one on the left is a clear glass, uh, non-coated, non-tinted glass. Uh, the one in the middle is smart glass, so it's a low-E coated glass. And then Lightbridge is our uh, Viridian's uh, double glazed, low E double glazed unit. Each of these three pieces of glass deliver exactly the same thermal performance. You can see you get a lot more daylight when you increase the performance of the glass. So as I suggested, we we're looking at a holistic building performance. So um, what pretty much all houses, uh, as Ray sh showed, we've got over a 75% penetration rate of air conditioning into the market now. Uh, so most houses will be built uh, with, a, with air conditioning systems. So we knew in our heart that we had a, a high performing house. We wanted to test the water to see what size air conditioning unit would be uh, required for, for the building. Funnily enough, the air conditioning industry, when we asked this question to four different companies, all came back with the same answer, same question. How big's the house? They didn't care whether we had high levels of insulation, glazing, or a high star rating or not. They just said, how big's the house? And they came back with a bunch, of, a range of answers. They were mostly pretty high. So we then looked at strategies to optimise beyond what the uh, air conditioning industry was telling us. But, so the firstly, we looked at zoning. Now, traditionally, older houses, houses built at the turn of the last century, uh, would have been built with small rooms and doors and, uh, and, and uh, lots of uh, partitions within the house so that you only have to heat or cool a very small area. Um, such as Ray's grandfather's house, there was heating provided to two rooms plus the, uh, the wood combustion stove in the kitchen, so you're effectively heating three rooms, but they would close off those doors to contain that heat. So we looked at modern day zoning. And we want to see what's going on in the house. We want to see, we want access to that daylight. We want visibility and connectivity between the house. So we introduced some glass partitions that helped us zone the house and zone certain areas within the building. This allows us, again, to have connectivity to the front street, to the outside world, or to just uh, see what's happening in the rest of the house. You can put acoustic graded glass in these uh, partitions, and then you're acoustically isolating the front of the house from the back of the house, but still having that visual connection. We then said, OK, well, for this space, the kitchen, living, dining and family room in, within the CSR house, it's 66 square metres. What would we be required to put an air conditioning? What size air conditioning system would be required within this space? 
So we went online, we found uh, an air conditioning uh, sizing calculator on one of the uh, air conditioning company's websites and it was asking some basic questions. You can see here we've got 66 square metres. It asks, do the windows face west? We with none in this case. And is the ceiling insulated? Yes. It came out with a seven or a nine kilowatt cooling capacity system just for 66 square metres. We thought that sounded a little bit excessive, so we then did a little bit of analysis on our own. We pulled the, uh, the heating and cooling load files out of the energy rating software, and it gives you an hour by hour analysis of the performance of that room. You can do the whole house, but we chose that, those, that room. And firstly, we spec'd up the house with, with no, in, no insulation at all and an unsealed room, so very leaky. And look, lo and behold, 9 kilowatts and 7 kilowatts covered almost the entire year of the heating and cooling load of the house. So we looked at that and thought, well, that's a bit strange. This is the eight-star room, eight-star performance of the 66 square metres with air tightness measures introduced. So now we can achieve pretty much the whole year using a three-and-a-half kilowatt system at a fraction of the cost of the others. That's the installation cost, so that's the, the supply and fit cost that's represented up there. Smaller systems running at higher um, outputs run more efficiently than larger systems that are oversized for their, for their duty. So they run more efficiently as well. They'll save money in the, in the long run as well. So in summary, to ensure your next project really provides a great performance, and by that we mean holistic comfort and living performance, you need to focus on the whole building. You really need to focus on the insulation, make sure it's specified right, but it's also installed right. Make sure the glazing is, is uh, performance glazing in good uh, performing frames. Get the right levels of daylight. Get good position of thermal mass and shading. Ensure that everything's installed correctly. Buy a thermal imaging camera. It's cost effective and use it to show your clients. Use it to make sure that the trades on site are doing their job. Design it right, build it tight, and ensure you can turn the theory into reality. Thank you very much.